This is an instructional video for the use of the radio forearm free flat for the reconstruction of a lateral tongue defect. In this video you will learn that the fascio cutaneous free flat harvested from the radio forearm can be used for the reconstruction of oral cavity among many other defects in the head and neck. This is a young patient with a squamous cell carcinoma of the right lateral tongue that extends back to the glossotonsillar sulcus. Visualization of this particular cancer in this video is difficult secondary to its location, even for the surgeons. Keys to success here are a negative margin status, exposure, and in instances where you are unable to visualize the extent of the entire tumor, a lip split mandibulotomy can be utilized. Here you can see the ablative team working around the cancer on all margins, on all sides, using a heart-shaped tongue retractor for adequate exposure and removing the patient's primary tumor. After the removal of the patient's tumor, we proceed to the left forearm, in this case, to harvest the patient's radial forearm free flap. The decision to use the patient's left arm in this instance is because he's right-handed and will likely need his right hand to write and communicate and function in the immediate post-operative period where his left arm is less able. The skin panel is centered essentially on the patient's radial artery, can actually extend from the antecubital fossa and almost circumferentially wrap around the arm if you need a piece of skin that big, but oftentimes for most upper air digestive tract reconstructions, less skin is needed. We then extend a tail off of the proximal aspect of the flap towards the antecubital fossa. The arm is then exsanguinated using an SMAR wrap and the tourniquet is inflated to 250 millimeters of mercury. We begin with our curvilinear incision along the proximal aspect of the forearm. This goes down through the skin and subcutaneous soft tissues until the fat is exposed. We take special care here not to go down aggressively through the fat as that might damage the cephalic vein as it lies just underneath the skin here, particularly in thin individuals. Our next step is to incise the proximal portion of the skin paddle, conjoining it with our curvilinear incision. The skin is then grasped with the gerald's with teeth and elevated on both sides of the curvilinear incision. A small bit of fat should be present on the underside of the skin as it's elevated as to not damage the subdermal plexus. If this is taken too thin during elevation, patients will wind up with necrosis, particularly on the distal aspect of the skin here. Elevation is continued proximally in the forearm 
Here you can see just beneath the fat, the patient's cephalic vein. As we move along, small vessels are bipolar cauterized and larger ones are clipped with smaller medium sized clips. Two surgeons can work, one on each side of the arm in this instance. Typically, the primary surgeon will sit on the radial side during this case. We continue to move distally in the forearm, making incisions on both the radial and ulnar aspects of our skin paddle. Skin flaps are raised on each side of the skin paddle in both the radial and ulnar directions, again preserving a small volume of fat on the underside of the dermis to prevent tissue necrosis. Special care should be taken on the radial aspect of the dissection as the uh, radial nerve, as it comes out from underneath the brachioradialis, proceeds towards the thenar eminence. Oftentimes you will see the radial nerve in close association with the veins as they branch out on this side of the arm. We'll see this shortly. If you look closely, just underneath the distal aspect of the cephalic vein pictured here, you can see the patient's radial nerve, or at least one of its branches. The distal aspect of this vein is clipped. And the rest of the radial nerve dissected in order to prevent thenar hypesthesia in the immediate post-operative period. Oftentimes there's more than one branch of the radial nerve. And here you can see another small branch of the radial nerve being elevated away from the skin paddle. While dissection of these branches does undermine the radial aspect of the skin panel to a certain degree, it's important to preserve these branches, again, to prevent loss of sensation along the radial aspect of the hand. In this case, we had an assistant who helped with some of the ulnar dissection, but here you can see we develop a similar plane underneath the muscular fascia on the ulnar aspect of the radial forearm skin paddle. This dissection will generally join up with the dissection that we performed distally, and then we will proceed with isolating the radial artery. After dissection of the ulnar aspect of the skin paddle, we begin searching for our radial artery. Generally, a mosquito forceps is used for this. Smaller veins around the artery are bipolar cauterized or sometimes even tied. And then the radial artery, which you can see here, is clamped on both sides physically tied with silk ties.
The radial artery generally lies in this location. It can sometimes be partially obstructed by the flexor retinaculum. After tying the artery, which you can see here, gripped with the forceps, we begin dissecting distally to proximally, transecting and ca or cauterizing the deeper branches that supply the muscles of the forearm and the radius. dissection is continued. You can see the smaller vessels being bipolar cauterized and some of the deeper vessels being either clipped or tied. You can see here the tendon and distal muscle belly for the brachioradialis muscle. The course of the radial artery is that it generally goes deep to the brachioradialis as we head towards the proximal forearm. And thus, a double pronged skin hook is used to retract laterally the brachioradialis so that we can see the course of the radial artery. This type of retraction will continue to be used as we head further proximally into the forearm to the point at which the brachioradialis and the flexor carpi radialis overlap. Here you can see the progression of dissection with the brachioradialis retracted using that double prong skin hook and on the opposite side perforators going into the flexor carpi radialis are being clipped and cut because of their size and diameter. We continue to follow the radial artery and its venae comitants, which are the accompanying veins, back towards the origin of the radial artery, off of the brachial artery. Prior to the origin of the radial artery, you will see the radial recurrent artery, which is the largest lateral branch of the radial artery in the forearm, arising just after its origin. It courses proximally on the supinator from its origin to form the arterial arcade with the anterior branch of the profunda brachii. Sometimes the radial artery can be taken just distal to the takeoff of the radial recurrent artery. Other times the radial artery can be taken proximal to the radial recurrent artery or distal to its branching off of the brachial artery to obtain a larger diameter vessel for microvascular anastomosis. Here we can see the deep venous structures in the proximal forearm around the takeoff of the radial artery. 
This generally tends to be an arcade of veins that is relatively difficult to dissect. So some time and patience is required here in order to make sure the veins are ligated properly and safely to avoid bleeding after the tourniquet is let down or after the flap has been reanastomosed. In this region you will generally see the venae comitants, which follow the radial artery, join up with the superficial circulation in the cephalic vein. Here you can see the cephalic vein isolated, where the deep venous circulation joins up with it. The flap has now been essentially pedicled on the radial artery and the cephalic vein and the tourniquet let down. At this point in time we'll see an influx of reperfusion bleeding in both the flap and the wound created in the forearm by its harvest. This is a great opportunity to carefully look for areas of bleeding and address them with either bipolar cautery or with clips in order to prevent a hematoma in the arm postoperatively or to prevent bleeding in your flap after it's been reanastomosed. Here we place clips on the radial artery and the cephalic vein. The vein can generally be clipped two clips on each side and cut. The artery is generally clipped on the flap side and tied on the patient side in order to prevent the clips from slipping off of the artery and causing a relatively large bleed in the forearm. Here you can see the cephalic vein being cut between our clips and the radial artery being cut between the clips that we've placed and a clamp which we are currently placing. After the flap has been removed, a tie is placed into the clamp on the stump of the radial artery. Again, this prevents the possibility that on the relatively narrow stump that a clip might slip off and cause an abrupt arm hematoma. The wound is then carefully evaluated, irrigated, and a seven flat channel drain is placed in the proximal forearm. The drain is placed between the bellies of the brachioradialis and flexor carpi radialis musculature and cut short as to prevent aspiration of the distal forearm where a skin graft will be placed. proximal forearm is then closed with a series of deep interrupted vicral sutures and a running monocryl suture. With the proximal forearm closed, the distal aspect of the forearm is now ready to receive a split thickness skin graft generally harvested from the thigh. For the harvest of that skin graft, we use the Zimmer dermatome set on 0 0.020 inches. The skin graft is placed over the wound, circumferentially sewn into place with the chromic suture small holes are placed in the skin graft 
in order to allow for egress of serosanguineous fluid. These holes should not be placed over tendons. And after the placement of a skin graft, seroform dressing and a wound vac is placed over the wrist. The free flap is then taken back to the head of the bed. This part of the procedure is called inset. The flap is circumferentially sewn into place. And you can see here that we've already sewn a fair amount of the free flap into the patient's native tongue in order to reconstruct the right lateral aspect of the tongue in this individual. Generally, the free flap is sewn into the native tongue using a series of horizontal mattress sutures with a 3-0 micro pop-off suture type. This is done around the entire perimeter of the free flap, conjoining it with the native tongue. During this aspect of the procedure, it's very important to carefully evaluate all of the edges of the flap and make sure that they are firmly secured to the native tissue. Inset is perhaps the most underrated portion of free flap surgery, but is perhaps the most important, as small leaks around the free flap can result in egress of saliva into the neck and deep spaces of the floor of mouth and result in abscess, flap failure, and other complications which can be challenging to address postoperatively. Now we move on to microvascular anastomosis. Here you can see the native arteries and veins on the free flap side being clamped, cut, irrigated, and the adventitia cleaned. Here we are performing the aforementioned tasks on the radial artery for which we generally clamp with an Ackland clamp. It's the smaller clamp that you can see on the base of the artery. We then use a technique called triangulation, pulling on the adventitia with three different forceps using two different microsurgeons. And use a small, straight micro scissor to remove the adventitia. This prevents the adventitia from prolapsing into the microvascular anastomosis and acting as a nidus or thrombus, which could potentially result in flat failure. We then move to the vein, and in this individual, he had already had neck surgery, and thus we had to perform an end to side microvascular anastomosis of his cephalic vein to his jugular vein. To perform an end to side, the caudal and cephalic aspects of the exposed jugular vein are encircled with vessel loops. Blood flow is stopped, the vessel is entered using a micro scissor. The cephalic vein is similarly clamped with a bulldog clamp, cut, cleaned, and prepared for venous microvascular anastomosis. After doing this and having all of our vessels prepared for microvascular anastomosis, we start by conjoining the artery. Here you can see the patient's radial artery, which has been prepared, as we mentioned previously, being conjoined to the patient's facial artery. This is done with an 80 ethylon 2808 suture. And you can see that the suture is so small, you can barely see it on video. Two sutures are placed 180 degrees apart. The sutures are left long and left with the needles on. Here you can see our second suture being placed. This suture will be tied and again 
left long with the needle intact in order for it to be run to the first suture we placed on the opposite side of the vessel 180 degrees apart. When these sutures are run together, they will be tied to one another, with the needle end of one suture being tied to the tail end of the opposite suture. After the suture has been run, all the slack is removed. And the needle end of one suture is tied to the tail of the one placed opposite. With the artery conjoined, we then move on to the veins. For ease of access in this particular patient, the vessel loops placed above and below the small venotomy that we created in the patient's jugular vein have been replaced with bulldog clamps, the big clamps you see with the V on them. We then use the sinovus coupler, which has two plastic rings embedded with spikes to pull the vein through and impale the vein on these tiny spikes. This is done again using two microvascular surgeons. One surgeon holding the coupler and a small impaling device which has a gap between the distal aspect of the forceps. And another holding two jeweler's forceps to pull the vein through. This is performed with the cephalic vein which you can see has been circumferentially embedded onto the coupler and then with the jugular vein. With the jugular vein circumferentially embedded onto the coupling device, the device will be closed, conjoining the cephalic vein with the jugular vein, in this instance, for an end-to-side anastomosis, meaning the end of the cephalic vein is joining the side of the jugular vein. This can be replicated with other veins, like the common facial vein or external jugular vein, for an end-to-end -end anastomosis. After our anastomoses are done, both venous and arterial, the clamps are let off. And here you can see the facial artery pumping away, pumping blood into the radial artery through our anastomosis. After letting the clamps off, both the arterial and venous side, we place a Cook implantable Doppler around the radial artery distal to the anastomosis and secure it in place using a single medium-sized clamp. At this point in time, you should be able to hear triphasic or biphasic flow through the artery and the wound is closed.